Everyone, you are in for a treat today. And I can say that confidently because of the conversation I was having with our guests before the show, that it is very just energetic and humorous, and it's going to be a very down-to-earth, real conversation, which is the type of conversations that we love on I Could Never Be here on the Popcorn Talk Network. We love sharing the stories, the real, authentic stories, the stories that you know you might not have heard before, and the stories that are inspiring because you hear the obstacles that people have gone through, the people that you see on your TV screens, the people that you go to their concerts, or you see them in magazines and you're like, man, I want to be that person. But oh, as the show title says, I could never be that person because maybe they had more money or maybe they knew people or they're not going through the struggles that I'm going through. And that is absolutely just not true. And we share the stories of the people who have achieved success on the show and help you realize that just like them, you too can overcome your obstacles and be able to achieve success. As always, we start the show with some advice for a better life. And this is something that you might have heard before or well, maybe give a different spin on it, and that is your only competition is the person that you were yesterday. And I know this message, you probably heard it before, your only competition is yourself, but I feel like it's just especially pertinent today because you log on to your phone and on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and you see so many people and you're like, man, I want to be like them. Oh man, I want to be able to, you know, they're, they're the reason that I'm not getting to get that job. They're the reason I didn't get this or that. But instead of looking at it as you lost it because of them, maybe look at it that the company or who else didn't choose you because they wanted a better you and someone that you can be tomorrow or someone that you can be in a week if you put your mind to it and work hard and be able to just, you know, go after the things that you didn't think you could do. And if you actually put your mind to it and you work hard, then you can be that better you that they actually wanted to begin with. And then you will get those jobs, get those positions, be able to achieve the things that you never thought possible. And I know our guest today has done that several times, maybe achieved something that she didn't think was possible. So excited to talk with her. She just wrapped up the fourth and final season of Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, which phenomenal show. I know so many people are dedicated fans of that. We miss it already. It's only been a couple of weeks. Please welcome Gabrielle Ruiz. Hi, Michael. Thanks for having me. Thank you for having me. So are we waiting um, uh, a minute or two minutes before we talk about the Texas-sized uh, waffle maker and A lot other... of pride of, of Texas. That's where I'm from, <laughs> to catch everyone up. We had this great warm-up chat of uh, how Texas people have merch. Yeah. We have a lot of merchandise from there. We and wear I, it I proud mean, and we wear it loud. Yeah, and I initially mentioned, like, oh, yeah, merch, like, you know, a keychain or obviously Texas belt oh, buckle. And then no, no. it's like, go bigger. No. Go like, bigger. what go do we te- got? Go Texas. Tell the people what they can get from I Texas. I have a Texas-shaped waffle maker. Why not? Well, first of all, waffles are delicious. Fact. That's an act. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. a fact. And second of all, I mean, Texas is great. <laughs> and so <laughs> when you're eating it, it's also a game of, like, where are you from? Because every time I explain where I am, where I'm originally from is Texas. Mm-hmm. I don't live there anymore. But uh, I say South Texas. And just like what you said, you're yeah. like, oh, Houston? I'm like, no, no, keep going. Yeah. You're like, oh, San Antonio? No, 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 mm-hmm. keep going. Further. And so I can, like, literally get the fork and be like, this is where I'm from. Mm. And I feel like you can actually say, since you're going south, like, getting warmer, getting warmer. <laughs> getting warmer. That's your... See where the butter's melting? That's where I'm from. <laughs> and your husband, you said, wanted to throw some of it away when you moved from New York. I know. York, how dare he? Like, He's oh. from Pennsylvania. Their state's not oh. so cute to look yeah, at what do you, waffle What do you shape? want a Pennsylvania I mean, shape? No. Just... Like... Like souffle maker, yeah, like nope. no cream brulee, Pennsylvania. Mm-mm. Okay, no, no. Lame. no right? We yeah. have to, you understand? You get it? I totally. Again, my parents had a Texas-shaped waffle maker. It broke, and they immediately had to go out and get a new one. <laughs> and I was like, uh, I guess, yeah. They just gotta have it. I, mean, I understand. Yeah, no one wants like a Colorado shape. That's a that's a rectangle. No, it's just yeah. boring. Yeah, it's just boring. Yeah. Texas has the right amount of shapes and dimensions. And right. Wow, exactly. we've really started the show off. Just hope it's inspiring so far. Hope this has inspired you to go on Amazon, <laughs> and I'm sure for the right price, you can too can have a Texas shape waffle, waffle maker. Well, I want to get into obviously Crazy Ex Girlfriend, which just wrapped up. But congratulations, by Thank the way, you so on much. on a great season finale, a great series finale, finale. the big one. Mm-hmm. How, I mean, we're a couple weeks past that. Uh, has deep it breaths. set in? Are you deep breaths? What, how do you uh, do? You feel great about how the show ended? I know a lot of people loved. It felt like it really came together. I I do feel lucky that the relationship that the cast had with Aline Broch McKenna and Rachel Bloom, the creators mm-hmm. of the show, were just always so one on one and personal, and and we were very very close family. So coming from New York, I lived there for almost ten years when I had booked Crazy Ex Girlfriend, which we'll get into. It's a really mm-hmm. good story, and. Um, uh, they've always been very transparent of how they always wanted to be four seasons. Mm-hmm. And coming from the theater world where you get a two-week notice before you 
lose your job on Broadway. That is just extremely luxurious. This has been really the longest gig I've ever had that was consistent. When we would break in between seasons, I knew that I had six months mm -hmm. to search for other projects or also kind of just live. And so that was the beautiful shift in my life with Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. That not only was Valencia amazing and I got to do musical theater on TV because that's yeah. what I've originally done, but... I also was able to kind of breathe a little bit, so <laughs> yeah, you took mentioned... a while, it took a while to get there, but it was definitely worth all the the blood, sweat, and tears. <laughs> yeah, and you mentioned like the, the the musical theater, and I think that's I want to talk about that you know later yeah. on in the show of like you laid a foundation uh, of being able to have the triple threat, mm -hmm. being able to act, be able to dance, be able to sing, and a lot of people might not have invested the time into being able to do all mm. those, and because yeah. of all that is why. You, you got this. Well, and it what what is what's the the stat where you're supposed to do ten thousand hours or something to be mm -hmm. an expert? Yep. Um, that wasn't me with acting. I mean, I, I was first I was first a dancer um, from Texas, obviously, and before YouTube and all that cute stuff where you could have so much exposure in South Texas, there was none of that. So mm -hmm. I just knew that I just wanted to continue dancing out of high school. And my dance teacher said, of course, there's NYU, because that's what the movies say, and and that's the dream. And Juilliard's this dreamy place, you know, and felt like, you know, never, never land New York City. And um, she was like, but also go to Oklahoma City University, audition for that. And that was the only college I got accepted into. And I thought New York was the dream. And so I was just a dance major first, fell in love with musical theater um, in college, and stayed dance because I still love to teach. I love to mentor, mm -hmm. and there was a great dance teaching program that was attached to our, our um, degree. Mm -hmm. But I didn't really start taking acting class until after my first Broadway show when a lot of my feedback in my auditions were, she's really, really great, she's very talented, it's just her acting. Like, it's her acting, it's her acting, hmm. it's her acting, it's her acting, it's her acting, <laughs> it's her acting. And I was like, what does that mean? <laughs> I'm memorizing lines, I'm saying it, I, I, I think I'm, I mean, I'm coming in prepared, at least I think it was prepared. And yeah. It was um, the third crap, the, the third leg of that triple threat was didn't really mm -hmm. happen until like my mid-20s. And I think that that's actually something that uh, a guest a couple weeks ago that we had mm -hmm. on talked about. And it was that people look, I said, what, what is the thing that you look at in Hollywood and entertainment that you think it is that people see differently or see people see wrongly? Mm -hmm. And she's like, that acting is easy. <laughs> Because yeah. you think, oh, how many people are sitting at home I being like, I thought that too, oh, and I was I, doing it. I can act. Oh, yeah, I can do that. And I'm sure, yeah, you were like, what am I doing wrong? Like, I'm, I'm it? doing it. What, right. what do you, else do you want? Right. And so, I mean, I think what, what solved it for me was to feel at least present, not, not again, like what you were saying in your, your moment before we started talking was like, to not just be a better you, but just learn how to be you mm -hmm. and how to break that like down that. and how to break that wall down to let people accept you in the room and whether and that's your job in the audition room is mm -hmm. to just do the best do you the best and and be as available to change and be as available to and be prepared you know mm -hmm. prepare the lines and prepare the work but you but you should go in the room to change and be and just be available because they're just i mean when someone told me into about auditioning like when you walk in that room like they're hoping you're the person wow. <laughs> they're like please because i mean the line is on they're on the line too producers directors music directors and whatnot and they, you walk in and they're like please be because we can stop looking and I've when i never... thought of it that way i was like okay i got some control in this room like i felt like we were equals and it just really kind of took a pressure off of me to just please like me or please i hope i'm perfect or whatnot so i just actually got to be myself and i was like all right let me know let me know if this is it. And if it's not, then hopefully it's for something else. I love that. Isn't that like, like mind that, blowing? That, that is like mind, mind blowing. blowing. I know. Because it, it's my it job does to share take, it. <laughs> it does take the pressure off. Because like you said, you go in there and you're like, I need to impress them, I need to impress them, I need to impress them. Like and it's over what it's mentally exhausting it's, before yeah. you even get in there and have to talk oh. or have to act or dance. It's creating or all these assumptions that don't exist exist yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You are helping them out. Mind blowing. Mind blowing. Oh, we're a couple minutes in, we're already <laughs> blowing your mind. But uh, even so, one more thing though, David Hull went in for Josh Chan, Vincent Rodriguez's role. Yeah. This is his story, but but Felicia Fasano, our casting director, tells it a lot, and Rachel does too, because he wa walked in and was extremely talented. Or I think he went in for Greg actually, mm -hmm. and he was like, I think Vincent Rodriguez the Third was already casted. And they were, he was already like up there and, you know, with, with being considered for that role. And um, Felicia was like, he looks like a white Josh. And they were like, 
that's hilarious, actually. Rachel thought that's a brilliant thing. And then the white Josh role was written for David Hall. <laughs> you and never he, know. And he just became this beautiful love story with Pete Gardner's Daryl, white feather mm -hmm. role. And mm -hmm. just, you know, you never know. You just really go in and be yourself. And yeah. you are loved. And you're in this wonderful roster of great actors. And, and you just the, wait and, for it to work out. And the reason you don't get a role today is the reason you get a role tomorrow Ugh, a lot of times. It's so true. And it's it's hard to comprehend because <laughs> you're like, but I don't want to wait until tomorrow. And I you're like, no. Yes, I know, but <laughs> the reason you don't get something today, you'll get it tomorrow. Your character, uh, Valencia, I know you're not exactly like Valencia. Valencia is like the total frenemy, like total <laughs> sarcastic. That's my favorite compliment I get from people. You're so nice. <laughs> oh my gosh, you're so nice. But then I would hit them back and be like, oh my God, thanks for watching the show. And I was like, I need to stop shoving people because I'm excited that they love the show. Did you enjoy being <laughs> able to play out that role, though? Because it's not you. Absolutely. And being able to be like, oh, well, that's just my character, but it's like you able to oh, be that person. Well, just being the mean girl in yes. season one. And whenever, when we've done some live shows and live tours and whatnot, and we're about mm -hmm. to go into radio, uh, to do one in Radio City, two shows, actually, I love saying, can I, can I curse on this show? Yeah. I love saying, um, let's bring it back to season one, Valencia bitches. And the audience <laughs> goes mad because it's like, yeah, I mean, you loved her for hate. You hated loving her. And I did mm -hmm. too. And every yeah. time I would get an insult on Twitter, like, how dare she do that to Rebecca? I was like, thanks for watching. <laughs> thanks for loving the show. And it's just to be so, I feel like villains kind of get this this rap for just being mean when they're just really honest. Mm -hmm. So I didn't ever have to feel a pressure to be funny. I was able to be kind of this like straight man to Rebecca Bunch, to Rachel Bloom's mm -hmm. character where I would set up all these things for her, for her to be Rebecca Bunch. I had I had an absolute blast. And then her evolution was just such a special treat and mm -hmm. a cherry on top. Yeah. Did your character ever did you ever take your character off screen? Was there ever a point you where know, yeah. she came out and you were like, whoa, wait, I, that, that, I did not mean to <laughs> act like that. My eyebrow raise is a lot higher now. <laughs> I have to say, my yeah, I say the eyebrow raises, it's, the muscle grew a lot stronger in four years. Um, yeah, I'd say like my sass and my honesty in, with mm -hmm. some sass, you know, tones. Yeah. Definitely feels a lot more freeing now, and I, and I feel very liberated in my life. And you always have that excuse, too. <laughs> it would be like, oh, well, it was a character. It's. <laughs> I do I do find a lot of inspiration of Valencia from my sister, so I tell her that, and she kind of hates it, but at the same time, I'm like, you know, it's you. <laughs> the other compliment for this show that I think this show did in four years, it was such, it was, A, it was real and authentic. We talked about that. Mm -hmm. And B, I think it just... It was so diverse in terms of it, it, whole female cast, it, different ethnicities in there. It, it just really mm -hmm. talk about what, what on your side what you thought it did for entertainment and for just the, just the industry of Hollywood of being able to have yeah. Rachel be able to create the show and be able to be part of that and be able to have a female yeah. dominated cast. Like, how much do you think this show changed culture in four years? That's a great question. Where do I begin? Um, I would say the number one thing for me personally, is the moment Aline Brush McKenna pulled me aside and said, um, we are going to take a storyline for Valencia where she falls in love with a woman. Mm -hmm. And she said, and I just want to let you know, we're, we're not going to give you a song about it. Because a lot of breakthrough moments for every character, or for any kind of emotional, um, emotional point for a character is a song and dance in musical mm -hmm. theater. Mm -hmm. And she said, and I said, oh my gosh, that's brilliant. I said, there's no song and dance about it. And, yeah. that's, and she's like, that's Valencia's character where, because Aline said that she ha, she knows a, a, a woman, she knows a, a really good friend of her for many years that had children, was married, and then once the kids left the nest, they got a divorce, and then she just so happened to fall in love with the woman because she made mm -hmm. her laugh. Mm -hmm. And they just have lived the rest of their lives together. And, she, and they ever, all her friends were like, so what's the change? Like, how did that happen? Did you always know? Was it was it this underlying story that you had hidden for all your life? And she's like, no, it just, it just so happened to be a woman. I and people... I thought that story in that way hadn't been told. Valencia didn't have a coming out, her parents were, you know, and that story mm -hmm. needs to be told too, but mm -hmm. it just hadn't been, in my opinion, it was so beautiful to see that the person who was so extreme in her emotions and also didn't know what laughter was, she, this woman just made her life, and this, this, this woman laughed and found her mm -hmm. funny. And for Valencia, that's the mind-blowing moment. And then it just cuts to them happy. Yeah. in that episode and I thought that was so brilliantly done and not done before and I think y you hit the nail on the head where it's in such 
you know, in so many moments in society, people want to analyze things and be like, oh, what was this? Why was it? Right. And it's like, what's the backstory? Yeah, well, yeah. What, what, what? and then they're like, oh, let's, let's majorly blow it. And it's like, no, it's life. Exactly. Just and live. Just live. And some people felt, I mean, some fans tweeted back to us saying, thank you so much for telling my story in that way where mm-hmm. everyone was like, cool. Okay, so what are we going to have for dinner? And just kind of moved on. And like, oh, and there was a relief and whatnot. But but the, the actual like metaphor of like there was no song and dance about it. And mm-hmm. like what a pun for our show where Valencia yeah. didn't have to have this whole like three episode arc about it. It just happened. And, mm-hmm. and not to desensitize it at all or anything no, like that of no. supporting any community out there that needs to be, t- their story needs to be told. But I feel like that's also one as well. Yeah, sometimes, it, so much entertainment, you overhype things. Yes. And then you're like, oh, well, Hollywood come down things. from the hype. And you're like, no. It's, again, it's life. Yes. Just live. You know, because at the end of the day, when you get off Facebook or Instagram mm-hmm. like that, you still have to live. Right. It's still your life. And my favorite day on Instagram is when I'm not. Yes. Right? That's and so a, that's when fantastic. I actually, when I put my phone, I, I've made a, my resolution this year was to actually not sleep. I think it was last year to not sleep with my phone in the bedroom and mm. actually put it away to look around and just be silent and be still. Right? Yep. And that's what I felt with, again, like with Valencia and Beth's story, that just, it was, it was very still and it was, it was good. It was just good. Do you have one of those phone coffins? What? Do you know about these? No. These are a real thing. <laughs> It's like a small is it for little vampire box. Phones? This is a small little box because it's like you're putting your phone to sleep. Oh, oh yes. Someone tried. Someone tried talking me into that on Instagram, and I was like, "It's a sock." <laughs> okay, you're making me spend money on a sock. I can just put it in the living room and walk away. Five, I six, have seven, this eight. much self control. <laughs> I'm gonna be okay. Do you have one? I'm sorry if I insulted I do not, you about no. your, your coffin sock. I'm still like I know I'm addicted. <laughs> Which is the first step, right? I feel confident that I've admitted the yes, first step. I yes. haven't gone to step number two. Uh, but What is it, negotiation? I, yeah, right? So, yeah, it's like I still, like, I know it's the last thing I check before I go to bed. It's the first thing in the morning. But Oof, it's like. No, boo boo. At know. least not in the morning. I know. Get one of those alarm clocks that glows up and sings a bird song. And then you will be so happy when you walk to your phone because you're ready to work. It's true. It's Trust true. me, it helps me with my auditions. Listen, like with work, period. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it. You uh, look at that. You inspired me to do it. We'll see. Uh, Tweet me, <laughs> Instagram a selfie at you know whatever time you go to bed and say my phone is in the living room. Good night, Gabrielle, <laughs> and put it down. I can't wait to see. It. I will do that. I will definitely do that. Uh, you you t- mentioned like the song and dance numbers. Versus, yeah. like, when you, obviously you have Broadway experience and you're on Broadway and you have so much time sometimes to learn things. Mm-hmm. That was not always the case on this show, where it's like a couple days you oh, have yeah. to. Mm-hmm. How do you prepare for that of going well, in and knowing that it's just, all right, here we got, we got a couple of days, got to get this song number, got to get this dance I number? I love it. I absolutely really? love it. I love the adrenaline. Oh, mm. it's my rocket science. Like, when I was in phys- physics class and and like pre cal in high school, I was like, why is everyone so excited in here? <laughs> Oh, I just have to get through this class. Oh, but then when I learned, like, I was an understudy on Broadway three times. Mm-hmm. When I, my debut was in the Heights, and when I went on for the first time as a principal on Broadway, I had not learned second act yet, and I loved it. Like, I, I just like the adrenaline, be the hero, you're saving the show, yeah. and like, te- like the 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 dance captain who teaches you the show. Um, is talking to me on the sides of the stage to be okay, this is what's happening next, blah, blah, blah. Don't let Rosie's leg fly over and kick your face because she's coming in at the 38 count and blah, 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 blah. And like, I was just like, got it, done. So I love it. I'm sorry it's not a great story. No, 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 no. It's not, it, do you <laughs> it's not enjoy, a challenging story. You enjoy, do you enjoy the adrenaline of like being on edge and knowing something could go wrong? Um, is that It's it? more being a team to make it happen. Mm-hmm. Like the sh- batten down the hatches, mm-hmm. here we go. And... And especially from a live theater, st- high st- higher stake from television. And yeah. television, you can go back. You can, yeah. And so, and not Retake, often. Cut. Yeah, cut, let's go back. But also, I learned while transitioning from th- musical theater, live theater, to television theater, that if a mistake happens, do go back because sometimes they use the mistake take. <laughs> yes. Sometimes if you it's watch, better. I'm so good at yoga. There's this flip I do on a guy's <laughs> shoulders, and my whole, like, costume is on my face and if you, in the take I get my hand and I fix it like I, I, I swipe mm-hmm. the skirt down and I was like oh it's because it's not musical it's not live 
I should have just like really like fallen on my face so they don't use the tape. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I always say, because I used to be in TV news. I used to be a uh, uh, local news like I reporter and anchor. And the biggest thing I miss is like the live TV. You are on location yeah. and you're breaking news and you have three seconds. Mm -hmm. And it's like, all right, cut to you. Tell us what's going on. And, and you're there's like, no turning back. Da, 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 da. Yeah. And you always think, too, if you mess up, you gave the people exactly what they wanted. Yeah. Because that's why people watch live. Listen, Adina Menzel. When I did If Then with her on Broadway, mm -hmm. when she would mess up, she would literally break the fourth wall and talk to the audience, and they would go crazy. And it yeah. was never it was never like not classy. I mean, it yeah, was a very classy it in the way. Right Sometimes manner. there was one time when the house lights didn't go down, and there's this whole blackout moment uh, where she's on a spot, and we in the blackout, the entire cast runs from stage left to right all the way onto the stage, but the lights didn't go down in the house, so they saw us running. <laughs> <laughs> And she just commented whatever beautiful thing and funny thing she said just really makes the audience feel like they're with yeah. you, you know? So they love it. There had been talk of bringing Crazy X to Broadway or... Yeah, to, why not? Do you want that to happen? Do you, has there been talks or a TV movie? I mean, has there... <laughs> What what do you know that Could we can share like with the fans? you imagine like craziest girl from a middle school? Like all of us, <laughs> how how awesome that would be! All yes. the hormones rushing. Yes. <laughs> Um, I mean, I'm not in charge. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. All right. I'd be down for it. Let's I mean, I'm not it... going to do it, but I'll go watch the show. I'll do the red carpet. <laughs> it's hard. Listen, yeah. musical theater is hard. I, I, I'm I, not like running back to eight shows a week, let mm -hmm. me tell you. The moment yeah. I learned that there's free food and television sets, crafty. you can't make me go back, man. It's beautiful. To the bodegas and going yeah. to Dean and DeLuca and spend $30 mm. <laughs> for a sandwich that was made five days ago. <laughs> <laughs> Broadway played a huge role. Like you, you talk I'm grateful. About, I'm really grateful. I you, swear. <laughs> I know. I absolutely. Broadway played a huge role in you getting this role. And I know, yes. like Lin Manuel was kind of yeah helping you get this. And you talked about the, the crazy story. How did you talk about to the audience how you got this role? Sure, sure. Um, always wanted to do Broadway. Mm -hmm. Loved it. Um, my first big break was a chorus line out of college. I did the first national and then booked In the Heights um, a year after that with a lot of auditions in between that were no's. And it was like West Side Story was happening and like a lot of great Broadway shows that I went in for and didn't get. Mm -hmm. And so In the Heights happened. And I call, I, I mentioned that because that was like my honeymoon of New York. Like I was on a Broadway show. I was dating a guy in the show. <laughs> we would go and like have dinner in between. I was living on the Upper West Side, spending yeah. all my money, so running exciting. late, running late, taking cabs. <laughs> I'm doing it. I'm doing it. <laughs> and um, after that was my first big slump in the city of like not booking. It's her acting was the theme. Yep. Went to acting class and then uh, started learning how to save money. And I say all that because. You know, we can go into all those struggles, but I just remember always feeling like um, for new shows, I was I was a replacement. So there was a lot of fear that I had in me that I was what I was putting into my brain was I'm just B team. Like whenever mm. I can be the replacement, mm -hmm. I'm always first replacement. But people just to be on Broadway is a big deal. It's an honor Huge. just to be on Broadway, Gabrielle. Yes. Get it together and grow up. Like it's fine. <laughs> but I was always afraid that I just was never a team or never mm. thought of. Mm -hmm. So when the season um, of Hamilton was happening, On Your Feet was also coming to Broadway. Aladdin was already on Broadway. Um, and Hamilton was a big deal, and it was all the same team. And I never was seen for Hamilton. We tried getting me in, but I just never was seen mm -hmm. for it. Um, there were a lot of workshops for On Your Feet that I was never asked to do, and I knew the whole creative team. And I was mm -hmm. like, record scratch? How did that not happen? Yeah. What is Gabrielle not doing for people not to think of her? <laughs> <laughs> the Texas comes out all of a yep. sudden. <laughs> and um, and then also Aladdin, like just those auditions. I, I went in for Jasmine many times. Courtney mm -hmm. Reed, who originated the role, is the perfect person for mm -hmm. it. And she's actually doing it in London right now. I mean, the woman is like Jasmine in real life mm -hmm. and, a, and a saint and a wonderful person. So like, well, I'm not competing with that. No way. Of course <laughs> that makes sense. So when On Your Feet was happening, there was a moment when everyone – in auditions and all the other auditions were like, Gabrielle, wait a minute. You're doing on your feet, right? I mean, you're doing it, right? You do salsa, you you're under, you know, you're, mm -hmm. so, you're you can sing act and dance blah blah and I was like, you know, I mean, I keep going in for it. And it was the first time where I just kind of was smiling about it and not letting it get to me where mm -hmm. I was like, you know, I don't know why. Yeah, you, I wasn't yeah, resentful. Yeah. I didn't know I didn't need to have to get uh, like a, a glass of wine after. I wasn't depressed <laughs> about it and I just was like, I know my worth. 
I know that it, I guess it doesn't make sense to me why I'm not booking this job. Mm -hmm. And the whole team, I've worked with them in many other projects before, from the director to the choreographer to the music director. Didn't ever meet like the Estefans, but um, there was a final audition that they had me come in, and every other woman in the, all the other women in the waiting room were 15 to 20 years older than me. And I texted my husband, and I was like, I have no idea why I'm here. They're really trying to make me and put, they're really trying to put me in the show, and it's over. Wow. I was like, I shouldn't be here. And I just remember walking in, and like, it was kind of like this, like, putting, you know, putting my, putting this dream to sleep. It was time to say goodbye. And it was like kind of maybe the best audition I had because I just really sang a great song. I did, I made them all laugh and I walked out and I knew it. And it was the first time where I was like, I know my worth and this is not for me. I cannot force this to happen. And because mm. I didn't book that, two months later was Valencia auditions. And I sent in a self tape into outer space, like they feel where you always send all these yeah. tapes away and they never yep. come back. And this one did. Wow. And so I, and I always say it's like, cause all the other girls were doing on your feet, all the other Latinas. So that worked yeah. out. Like that, <laughs> I'm, kidding. That, I'm kidding. The no. stats, the stats. No. I was like, well, I mean, they're yeah. all booked. So, <laughs> so they didn't go in for Valencia. <laughs> so that made sense. Everyone has their seasons. Cause there was like, it was a wonderful group of women, my age, my mm -hmm. type, my, my talent in the city where we saw each other all in the same rooms and we would all text each other. Like who yeah. got it? who got the phone call two hours later because they're going to call or not, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And so it was it was wonderful that that I was so happy for all my friends who booked mm -hmm. that role, those 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 dance roles and, like, you know, the understudy for Gloria and Gloria, you know, Anna and whatnot, and, and it just, I felt okay about it. And so when Crazy X happened, I got a call on a weekend from my um, agent. He was like, so they really responded to your tape. They would love to see you at the um, CBS studios in New York for a Skype session. With, with the creators and they want to talk to you about the role. And so you kind of don't want to get excited, but of course you do. And you, get, so yeah. you start getting a little more emotionally attached. Yeah. Yep. And Valencia was not in the pilot. She was not in the first mm -hmm. episode. So there, I guessed on who she was. And I, I remember reading the script and there was one line that Josh says, um, oh, Greg is not, no, oh, no, Greg says it. He's like, uh, Josh is not coming to this party because he's at, his girlfriend's sister's quinceanera. Hmm. And I remember thinking, I was like, you know, I'm just going to guess that that's Valencia. I'm just going to guess yeah. because it would make just something, you know, intense and it would raise the stakes in the mm -hmm. scene. And then I had a Skype session with Rachel and Elaine and I was right, thankfully. You always, you always sometimes guess really wrong in auditions. <laughs> like you really guess wrong and you have to go for it. And sometimes you walk out of that room and you're like, well, well I don't know what that well, was. That was, that a was swing awful. <laughs> This one finally worked out. I mean, out of like a million, you know, mm -hmm. the batting average that you feel you go through. And um, my favorite memory of that Skype session with Rachel and Aline where I remember asking them, I was like, would you like me to sing again when I retape with mm -hmm. your notes? And Rachel was like, oh, no, no, it's fine. I've been stalking you on YouTube. We <laughs> get it. You can sing. <laughs> and I was like, finally, <laughs> all that shame was promoting. <laughs> It's finally pulling through mm. where I was so like type A specific about like if I was kind of cracking a little bit or something or the quality isn't good. Yes, I'm not going to put it on YouTube. It's mm. going to show up one mm -hmm. day. Yeah. <laughs> and when people think I'm crazy about those things, like I'm like planning 10 years ahead. Yep. You should listen to me, man. You're laying the foundation, which is, again, it's like what we talked about. Be able to do all three things, be able to get this job. Did you think why? I mean. Obviously, I'm sure you thought at the time, you're like, wow, I'm really glad I didn't get oh, that yeah. Broadway. Do you think about that every year or every, every time single now? Every time. Every time now, maybe when something doesn't go your way Absolutely. and you're like, oh, well, there's a reason. Oh, I had a wonderful pilot season this year. It was the first mm -hmm. time I was able to really go out for new projects on television. Mm -hmm. And I was super close to one thing twice. And at the very last minute, it went another way. Hmm. And to remember everything that I just went through and to remind myself my own lesson that I, you know, try to tell the youngins it's going to be fine. And the reason you didn't get it is because it's even if it's a no, it's not right now. Mm -hmm. And it's tough every time. And you just got to breathe through it and also allow time to be sad about it. Because if you try to resist it, it will persist. Mm -hmm. The anger, which turns into resentment, which can turn into, you know, you keeping yourself from other people and then Instagram, forget about it. I mean, at least that wasn't there when 
I started theater and like started oh. this career. I mean, it's vicious to vicious. yourself, yes. to your own soul. And yes. when you wake up in the morning and that's all you're doing is comparing yourself to people. And and I, I, yes, I absolutely have to remind myself the same lesson over and over. It can drive you mad. It literally mm -hmm. can drive you mad. But the people you surround yourself with, the other, you know, activities and hobbies that are mm -hmm. not industry related to just have a healthy lifestyle, I believe, is just really, really key to stay sane in the insanity. <laughs> as much sane as possible, at least, yeah. As much. But also, like again, that one stage, though, of being sad about it. Like, mm -hmm. I remember in New York, the B-team phase, when I was just, like, crying to my mother on the phone, and she was like, do you want to come home? And I was like, no, I just need to cry about it. And then I will wake up, and I'll just try again tomorrow, but just let me be sad. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I just remember that. So... I, I really, really, truly believe that you being sad that you didn't get it is okay. Feel it and then move on. You mentioned you were an understudy three times. I was. Is that normal? I mean, what I, for someone who doesn't know Broadway acting, yeah. I mean, is that obviously understudy means that you're you're the backup, you know, right? Yeah. 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 You're the person no, that's you know, on on the, you know on all the, the sides lines, ready to go in case someone calls in sick, in case mm -hmm. something happens. Understudy three times. How many times is a normal person understudy and like? I feel like it's a niche okay. uh, position because um, you have to be able to do, uh, you know, the same song and know all three harmonies because mm -hmm. both the, all the three and, and especially like for example um, in, in the Heights, I understudied Vanessa, Nina, and Carla, and they're all in the same salon song, and I had to learn all the harmonies that weren't always one person wasn't always on the top harmony, but um, I loved it, and it's it's a lot of homework. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of watching on the sides when you're an ensemble member anyway. It doesn't mean you're off stage the whole time. I was also on stage as an ensemble person. So you're also watching other people while you're on stage and just like actively rehearsing things. It's a lot more time because you have rehearsal during the daytime before the show mm -hmm. to, to have like some runs at it. Um, I feel like it's a, it's a certain community of people in, in theater that do that. And um, the, harder, the harder position is a swing on Broadway that they are the unsung gladiators that understudy the ensemble. Wow. So they have to know a lot. And everything is all, almost all the same, right? So it's also, like, more general and more people. Mm -hmm. And so, like, if you're doing, like, right, st right, left, right, left, marching, facing wall four, but the person right next to him who they also understudy is on wall three on the other foot, like, they have to know all of that. And if they run into a person... <laughs> It's obvious. Yes. So they're like, I mean, I have to just, you know, mad props to all of our swings out there because it's like understudies on steroids. It's bananas. What was and your, they're off stage the whole time. What was your attitude when you got the understudy position? Obviously, when you wanted the main position, realize you were, again, the understudy on maybe like time, obviously time one, I'm sure you're like, well, I got something. Yeah. Time two or time three. How did you approach those of trying to learn or grow? Mm, that's a really good question. I have to say... Well, I had more. I had experience, so based off experience, mm -hmm. it was nice to know how much work it took and how much attention it takes. And also, I, I was glad that I liked it, you know, versus mm -hmm. feeling just taking a job because I needed it, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, I I did enjoy changing it up too because eight shows a week for a year, a you have to keep it fresh. You have to keep it also consistent. You have to keep it um, interesting for the audience, and then the audience might not laugh one day, so you have to stay active. And I, I when I did <clears throat> a chorus line, I, I was a principal on that show, and I started like making false adrenaline things to me, like freaking myself out, like, oh, I'm not gonna know my lyrics, or I'm gonna forget, I'm gonna forget, and it was all false. I just remember thinking that, like, I'm just kind of bored maybe, mm -hmm. right? So I, I need something to like, you know, make, I'm making my own drama. So being an understudy, there's always drama. <laughs> and again, like the hero feeling of being able to save the show last minute or someone is like, I did, I did enjoy taking that position to just be that one insert to keep the show running forward. And, um, and also um, understudying the legends that I was able to like follow off stage as well and ask them questions about their track and, and see the characters that they developed. Well, my favorite memory, my, my favorite moments though, when you go on the first time as a principal from the understudy position, I make sure that the show 
is it's it's almost it's a it's a, it's a very humbling thing. Like you got to make sure the principal's shows feel the same. Mm -hmm. Like you can't give him like this really different character or a really big different line or a different like sidestep. You can't yeah. make it bigger and yeah. stuff because they're like, whoa, like this yeah. is not my show. And you you know, as a team member, you don't want to distract them. Mm -hmm. So I make sure to like. It was always an honor to do that for them, to make their show wonderful and the same so they can do their show. And then after they see you a bit and you know, you're know you holding hands with that person because you're a couple and they get used to Gabrielle, then I can start adding like my character yeah. development into it. And I always enjoyed that process with all the other actors on stage. You mentioned being able to <clears throat> take things from people and be able to ask things from people. And I had read something or watched something where you had talked about the importance of humility. And mm. how, like, that was something that you had to learn because it, I feel like in any time of entertainment, people are like, no, I can do this. I can do this by myself. I can do this. And you talk <laughs> about the importance of being able to always know that there's something you can learn from every single person in the room. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Talk about how you <clears throat> learned that and what you, how you approach anyone. Like in, on the street? Yeah. Well, no. So, <laughs> uh, wh when did you I mean, learn... I'm humble on the street, too, if you ever run into me. <laughs> How did you learn the importance of, of humility and talk about what you kind of how you even just use that in life of knowing that, hey, I can learn something from anyone? Sure. Um, I just, especially like from a performer's point of mm -hmm. view, is what I can give you today is all that I can. It might not be tomorrow. It might not be yesterday's, especially like live performing. And when my voice was, you know, going awry or feeling hoarse, there, uh, Kristen um, Wyatt, she's a a beautiful, beautiful musical theater performer, and she said that to me in the dressing room when I was just so quiet and like dreading going on stage because I wasn't sure how my voice was going to be. And she was like, "What you can perform today is all you can give." And I remember thinking that, like, I am a body, I am a vessel. Everyone around me is here to help me, and so mm -hmm. when someone is in that position on stage or or in that position with me in a cast, like I just remind them of that too. Like what you have today, if your leg isn't as high or you're working on an injury or you're feeling like you are distracted because family is, you know, something in your family life is going crazy and whatnot, this is all you can give and that's okay. And it just kind of takes the pressure off mm -hmm. to be able to be present. Mm -hmm. And that was a big lesson for me that I, I tried to like, to humble myself to also like, remember that fans or the audience or the viewers and the directors and everyone is really wanting just you to feel good about what you're doing and that's okay absolutely let's talk goals let's talk uh, i know you're hashtag big, goals hashtag <laughs> goals hashtag i was gonna say that in like a total yeah didn't do it <laughs> um just like i was writing at a hashtag on an instagram post hashtag goals hashtag, hashtag goals. blessed hashtag, hashtag humbled <laughs> hashtag gabriel ruiz <laughs> Uh, I know you're big on vision boards. I am, right? man. You did your homework, I man. I did my homework. Uh, talk about what you... Oh, my you, gosh. How I'm do you excited decide, to talk about my vision boards. When did you get into today, vision boards? I just said today, I was like, man, I need to do my vision board. It's so expired. There's okay. a reason. There's a reason you came in today because I'm challenging Listen. you. Just like you're challenging me on the phone, I'm challenging you with the vision board. <laughs> i got to do it tonight. Oh. <laughs> um, so during... Struggle, struggle bus times mm. in New York. Mm -hmm. um, I need to make money, and this MLM company got up, got to me, and it was not the usual ones that you know. It was actually like a health and wellness one, and um, I just joined it to make money. I was like, whatever, <laughs> I can sell anything. I come from a salesman family. Let's do it. And then I actually stopped getting sick, and I actually started getting healthy on it. <laughs> it actually worked. Ugh. And one of the biggest, like, first coachings that, like, my upline did with me, Melinda Usangivaras. Mm -hmm. Hey, girl. Um, <laughs> she was like, make a vision board. And I was like, what? I was like, I don't have time for that. And she was like, no. She was like, I was like, how much money am I going to make? Like, foaming at the mouth in New York City, <laughs> like, just rabid in the concrete jungle, you know? <clears throat> and she was like, no, no, no. What do you want? Like, what's your why? What? I was like, what are you talking about? And she's like... <laughs> What, what, what things do you wish you could have? Like, where do you want to go on vacation? Or mm -hmm. what is it that you want? And I remember just how much I learned. I, I was breathing again. My face lit up. I Like, my shoulders maybe lowered 10 inches. And it was just such an, it made such an impact in my New York life that, <clears throat> you know, you're so overstimulated by humans and, and just always, like, go, 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 go in the grind that you can't slow down in New York. And so that slowed me down. And it gave me another 
it just gave me an outlet to remember why I was there and also like how to live there, not just work there. Mm -hmm. So that's how vision boards changed in my life. But a roommate of mine who's a yogi and she's just a wonderful person, always did vision boarding as well. And so we made a um, we made a promise to each other to host a vision board soiree, VBS, not to be cute, be confused with the Vacation Bible School. Similar. But we called it VBS. Probably there a was similar wines. amount of wine. Yeah, <laughs> similar amount of wine at both events. Yeah. But we, we, the joke was VBS every Sunday, like third Sunday of the week <laughs> of the month, and um, we hosted a vision board party that was not us talking about work, not talking about you know those kind of goals, and anybody could invite people, and the change of every human that would walk in that in that living room to the point when they entered to when they exited, you were meeting people on the account of their dreams versus on the account of work, on the account of goals, on the account of struggles and what they don't have. Mm -hmm. And you got to see people and someone was like, I'm looking for an elephant. And you you would meet someone because you found that elephant for them. And just, it was just so amazing. I needed it. My roommate needed it. Everyone that came had a wonderful time, and so I, I still do host those as much as I can. And I feel it's a like, nice way to meet people. Absolutely, I feel like vision boards definitely <laughs> help you stay focused not on just not on just like what you want, but what you want right, right now. Yeah, because the, everyone has a plethora of goals. Absolutely, a plethora of things that they want to do, but it's like maybe not this year. Well, and also though, vision boards also give you the opportunity to. Find something that inspires you visually or just, in, you know, instigates or provokes mm -hmm. a feeling when you see the image. And I always encourage people to put that on your board as well because that shit comes back. And all <laughs> of a sudden it makes sense. And you're like, whoa, that popcorn talk picture, whoa. And just like it makes sense. Or you just took pop out of the logo yep. and you mm -hmm. and the pop means something later. And it is scary how magical, literally magical mm -hmm. it is that your, your brain and – your your subconscious is, is projecting something that you didn't even know was it wasn't time then it is now. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Whoa! Uh, Everyone go vision yeah. board tonight. <laughs> it's so much fun. It's a great excuse it for is. arts and crafts and wine. Yeah. <laughs> if you need another excuse for wine, here's well, another one. Yeah. <laughs> um, you are obviously in a, happily married to Philip, and I know he's involved in entertainment too. Yes. How much do you guys complement each other, and how important is well, that? He's not to an actor, able... thank God. No. Yeah. Why do you say that? Why? <laughs> There only Would needs to be, be one of us. No. <laughs> <laughs> it needs to be one. It's so dramatic all the time. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm sorry. What was your question? How do you, how <laughs> totally hijacked that one. How do you compliment each other? And do you did you find that it was? I know some people in entertainment don't like to be with someone who is in entertainment, not mm. in entertainment. If that made sense, they like to be with someone not in entertainment. How do you feel like being with someone else in entertainment helps complement your relationships, help complement your mm. growth? Um, well, he's a lighting designer, mm -hmm. <laughs> not an actor. Um, and we met on Match.com, and our like three non-negotiables matched, and none of them had to do with work. What are the? Do you mind if I ask the non-negotiables? Sure. What are, sure. What are those three non-negotiables? <laughs> Well, I discovered, um, I was always, I grew up Christian mm -hmm. and um, loved it, loved that was a big part mm -hmm. of my life. I walked away from it in my 20s and then I rediscovered that it was a big part of me that more than I knew. I didn't really choose it. I feel like that was just my connection to something bigger. And um, the other guys that I dated, they were the ones that had the problem with it. And you think like the Bible beater people like me, you know, yeah. that we're, we're considered to be like, you have to be a Christian or whatever. Yeah. And I was like, I'll compromise. It's fine. You don't, you can mm -hmm. be spiritual, whatever you want. <laughs> and there were those like, I can't do that for you. And I was like, oh, oh, like this is like mm -hmm. a big part of my life that I need to find someone to like yoke myself with, mm -hmm. to be able to go in the same path, to like raise, you know, a life with and a family, mm -hmm. hopefully. So that was a big one. I put that first. And then, um, I mean, <laughs> the other ones are just like, we, we just, everything that we talked about that were non-negotiables, like, we just were like, yeah, me too. Cool. Yeah. And, like, we didn't live together until we got married, mm -hmm. which was my favorite one to tell people because they're like, oh, really? I'm so well, sorry. Why? Yeah. <laughs> you know, you should, like, try that out. And I was like, listen, <laughs> I'm a bachelorette, and I like my color for home. Mm -hmm. I like my blue wall and my pink flowers and my red couch and my yellow kitchen and my green bathroom. It looks like a spa. Wow, a total Lots rainbow. Lots of colors. I'm a very colorful person. Philip had like black plates, black bar, gray walls, black <laughs> entertainment center. Like, 
<laughs> we were so opposite. <laughs> and like that was like a big choice to make a compromise to live mm-hmm. together. And we didn't want to make that compromise until we got married. Mm-hmm. And I was like, and also, honestly, the 50% divorce rate, come on now. Like, yeah. don't even try. But, don't even try to think I don't have a chance. Like, my yep. chances are just as yeah. bad as yours, yep. dude. But, <laughs> <laughs> like, or just as good. There you, like, glasses don't half put full. that on me. So I just remember that. That was one of our non-negotiables, and I don't remember the So who one. won with the wall color and the... <laughs> is it colorful in, in your place, or is it all black? You know, I do like... Um, what's that... Uh, the Magnolia Home People in Texas. What's that TV show? Um, oh, with uh, is it the two the twins? Is that what you're talking about? No. Or no? Oh, the, Joanne Gaines, yes, Chip the and Joanne. Gaines were like all gray tones. No <laughs> ship lap. I think it's a little extra, but we like the browns and the grays. And we decided. Philip kept sending me photos. Like, well, what about this photo? What do you like in this living room and not? And I was like, listen, like too many text messages. Yeah. A, but B, he was the one that pitched. Let's make a vision board. What? <laughs> That's when so you know. I'm so impressed. It's still up, and it really helps us like create a home that we both liked, and we talked about why and why not. And so when we go and look for things, it works out. That's awesome. It's a lot of gray. It's a lot of gray. A lot of white. <laughs> a lot of gains in there. <laughs> what drives you now? I mean, you, obviously, we just wrapped drives up. Me now. We just wrapped up X Crazy X, and the you know oh. moving on to a new thing. What drives you? And obviously, you're in a relationship. What drives you moving forward professionally, personally, like in everything you want to achieve? You're like, this um, is this is why. I'm definitely in the chapter of my life where we're uh, about to start trying to make a family. Oh, nice. And this pilot season, like I remember getting up really early, and I was we have a condo right now, mm-hmm. and with Crazy Ex Girlfriend, it was again like it was such a great like a nice wind in the sails for four years of like being able to like really get on our feet financially Mm -hmm. and invest and save money. So we bought a condo in LA. We moved from New York and the goal now, (laughs) my publicist knows this too. I was like, next is the house. Like I want my own four walls. So like the domestic part Mm -hmm. from being so career driven from both, from Mm -hmm. both of us, Philip moved here because I booked crazy ex-girlfriend and we were getting married. I was ready to be bi-coastal and he was like, no, I don't understand what that means. I'm going with you. And nobody had ever done that for me, ever. Mm. And so the domestic part of our lives that we both love to be and to become is now in that we're in that phase now. So there were some mornings in pilot season where you're doing going in for like four things and there's piles of clothes in the living room and you're just doing like as you're trying to memorize and just be as present as possible. And my dog Leela was like dragging out of her crate. And I was like, come on, Leela, we got to get a house. Let's get to go. Let's go, girl. I got to be on time because we got to get the house. So we got to get that house is the, uh, is the, is the phrase right now. Yeah. Well, I love how it's too, like the, the definition of success, I'm sure changes in various Absolutely. stages of life too, yes. where that's success right now, mm-hmm. being in a happy family, being in a place of your own. Right. And, and I didn't book anything this year yeah. immediately out of yeah. Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. And I look at my condo and I'm like, it's really nice. It's going to be okay. Yeah. It, <laughs> and we're be all okay. really happy. And like, there's so much more space than New York than we, mm-hmm. I mean, I have for the first time a closet that's not you know, fits 10 clothes in there. You know what I mean? Like, I cannot, yep. I just, I look back on that itty bitty little closet in New York. It's like, I can't believe I had mm. four seasons in there. And now I have no, not enough room for all my shoes and my purses. Yeah. Come on. Yeah, that is a different Come on, big, big, big difference between LA and <laughs> New York. Perspective. Yeah, it was like, <laughs> you, what, what you could actually, you can get a condo here versus there. It's all apartments. And oh, it, yeah. Yeah. Oh, so we got the puppy, which has been nice. nice. And we have the condo. It's ours. But to be able to, like, rent that place out yeah. and to get a house that yep. is the goal that we would love mm-hmm. to hit at some point but mm-hmm. the family is you know we're in the market I'll you're say. in the market that's great <laughs> looking back the final question that i love asking people is in 50 75 years 100 years whatever and people look back on your life and your career <gasps> and they're like man she was in this she was in this and they're like oh and someone's like who who and you're they're like oh they were blank. Oh. How do you want people to remember you professionally and personally? Someone describes you in 50, 75 years. What do you want them to say? Oh, my goodness, with pressure. Um, I guess wonderful. I would like to think people that would think I would. I would like for people to think that I was wonderful. Mm-hmm. Outside of, like, career, like as a human, mm-hmm. to be just around. She was so wonderful to be around. I would like I would like people to think of me that way. 
versus perfect or sensational <laughs> or or talented. You know what I mean? Because talent is such a such a weird word, you yeah. know, and and it gets skewed so much. But the word wonderful to me is just it's such an umbrella of just a joy to be around. Yeah, I would love. I hope I bring joy to people and I inspire them to like do that for others for sure. Well, you brought joy to this interview, and so <laughs> I you. appreciate you coming in, and I appreciate but you. But do you being think I'm wonderful? Open and honest. Well, the book's still up. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> yes, of course, of course. You were wonderful on Crazy oh, X. You're, wonder, you're even more wonderful in person. And thank you so much thank for coming you for on. Having and me. for being open and honest. I know sometimes we talk about things like, oh, I was really struggling and this was hard and I had to take this other job. But the person on the other side of this camera is, no. is the person there right now. No, you get and it. So, you get it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So go do your vision board and then uh, oh, go wonderful. put your cell phone outside of your room before you go to bed. <laughs> Uh, and those are the big things that we took away from this episode. And in go a, get a Texas Shave Waffle Maker. And go get a Texas Waffle Maker. Yes. <laughs> Hands down. If people want to follow you, by the way, after the show, uh, at Gabrielle Ruiz on Twitter and on Instagram. And on Instagram. You can follow me after the show, at the only MC on Twitter and on Instagram. And certainly go follow the Popcorn Talk. So much wonderful content here every week, at the Popcorn Talk on Instagram and on Twitter. We are nearing the end of this season of I Could Never Be, but there's so much more to come. So many amazing guests. And if you are new to the show, go back, look them up on YouTube, go on Apple Podcasts, just search I Could Never Be. And while you're doing that, like, comment, subscribe. I think it literally takes, I think I timed it the other day. It takes three seconds to go give five stars to a podcast on Apple. It literally, scroll to the bottom, hit five stars. Try to beat me. Go to see if you can do it two and a half. There's your challenge. Until then, we'll see you next time. From producers Maria Menunos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire Popcorn Talk Network, we would like to thank you for tuning in. For questions or comments, be sure to visit popcorntalk.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of the Popcorn Talk Network.